they did some predictive modeling and machine learning analyses of our large metadata set. And what they found was that for salmonella, when you had the brood feed, so feed given to the chickens in the first three weeks, and also once they were on pasture, the feed they were provided there, corn, if corn was one of the components, so the top three components of the feed, you ended up seeing a higher predicted probability of salmonella in the feces at the end of process, at the end of pre-harvest and in the whole carcass rinse at the very end. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. My name is Sam Rochel. I'm an associate professor of poultry nutrition at Auburn University and one of the co-hosts of the show. Uh, we work uh, to, to bring you the latest in poultry nutrition research and trends in approximately 10 minutes or less. Today, I'm joined by a USDA scientist out of Athens, Georgia, uh, Dr. Michael Rothrock, who is an expert uh, in, in uh, pre-harvest and, and all types of food safety, which we'll hear about and, and worked in a lot of different uh, systems. So uh, thanks. Thanks for joining us, Mike, and look forward to the conversation today. Thanks for having me, Sam. Um, so like Sam said, um, I work with the USDA ARS, that stands for the United States Department of Agriculture, Agricultural mm -hmm. Research Service in Athens, Georgia. Um, so we are the research arm of the USDA. So we're 100% research. Uh, we're all over the country on all different agricultural products that the United States uh, uh, produces. We have some research aspects to it. Um, and so we're housed in Athens, Georgia, in the U.S. National Poultry Research Center. Very good. And so I know historically you've worked a lot, as I mentioned, in, in uh, pre-harvest food safety, uh, looking at a lot of different systems, uh, but, uh, different rearing systems, yep. but also within each of those, the different systems that, that ultimately impact food safety. So can you talk a little bit about the recent work that you've, you've done in this area? Our work, like I said, is pre-harvest poultry food safety. So I'm a microbial ecologist by training. Mm -hmm. um, so I look at more of a microbial ecology aspect to food safety. So we take a systems-based approach trying to not only look at the pathogen that we recover and try to understand and characterize those pathogens, but also try to understand the environmental drivers mm -hmm. that impact the prevalence or the load or the diversity of those pathogens uh, within the pre-harvest system mainly, but we do bleed over into the post-harvest as well. Um, so lately in the past five or so years, we focus a lot on pastured poultry. So not the mm -hmm. conventional type of poultry being grown. So it's a very small part of the market, but I think there is consumer demand for those kind of products. So we started to look into some of those aspects because these types of birds are exposed to the environment much more so um, than a conventionally raised bird. So um, since this is a nutrition broadcast, we did indirectly um, do some nutrition aspects to the mm -hmm. work. So um, since we do do pastured poultry, um, there is a large variety of feed and types of feed that are used at, and it's really farm to farm. Um, so in order to control that scientifically, we had an extensive management questionnaire to try to really understand all aspects, all aspects, excuse me, of the management, but including parts of the feed. And some of the interesting findings we found were um, in one realm, we looked at the uh, soy free versus soy containing feed because mm. that was a big consumer interest right. having a soy free product. Um, and so what we found while it didn't affect uh, salmonella or uh, listeria, those are the two others we looked at. There mm -hmm. did seem to be an effect on Campylobacter. So we found significantly lower prevalence of Campylobacter, both on the day of processing feces, as well as the final whole carcass rinse that the customer would get um, in a soy-free diet compared to one that had soy. So there did seem to be some benefit and there is some potential ability of Campy um, related to its metabolism and the soy protein that may be resulting in that kind of finding, but we didn't delve very deep into that. And then a second finding we found through collaborations with uh, scientists at University of Georgia and Mississippi State, they did some predictive modeling and machine learning analyses of our large metadata set. And what they found was that for salmonella, when you had the brood feed, so 
feed given to the chickens in the first three weeks, and also once they were on pasture, the feed they were provided there. Corn, if corn was one of the components, so the top three components of the feed, you ended up seeing a higher predicted probability of salmonella in the feces at the end of process, at the end of pre-harvest and in the whole carcass rinse at the very end. So there is some, it was a stronger effect in the brood feed, less mm. so effect but still a, a, an effect in the pasture feed. So it seems that what we're feeding or what they're feeding them at the early stages probably is really establishing the gut microbiome and in thereby affecting uh, the pathogens that can survive within that microbiome. Yeah, very interesting. I think there's a lot of, a lot of things we can talk about within those kind of the, the big picture uh, topics. So, I mean, one, you know, you mentioned uh, it, this is mainly in pasture systems. And, you know, a, a, as you noted, most of our listeners and most of the industry is, is not in that. They're, it's more conventional. Right. But that said, I think there's a lot we can learn from these systems as far as, you know, how that might relate to just the overall ecology and in the, the levers in a conventional system. Um, yeah. You know, two, you mentioned the, so it was the soy-free diet that had the lower incidence of the campylobacter. Was that, that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Yes. And so do you know some of the predominant feedstuffs in the soy-free diets that were uh, replacing soy, what they were using? Did, did you have that information? Do I know them? Yes. Do I know them offhand? No, that I do not have. Up. But yes, no, it is in the database, in our database, what yeah. those feedstuffs were. Yes. I think largely... Yeah. P wasn't a big one that ended up um, replacing soy. Sure. Trying to remember the other ones, I can't. But I, for some reason, P is sticking in my head for that one, yes. Yeah, makes sense. I know that's a common one. And then on the on the corn aspect, you know, that's very interesting um, because, you know, obviously the U.S., we have corn, and so that's, that's yeah. our predominant uh, cereal grain. Um, you know, I'm wondering, like, uh, could there be mycotoxin at play or something indirectly that's, that's causing this – the the higher prevalence of salmonella or do you think it in my opinion be, i mean just based on the data that we have in hand it would be difficult to really ascertain some because like i said some of these sure. i mean some of these farms are basically you know okay you know i'm going to use this feed but you know i have some of this you know food refuse that i'm going to add to it and so mm -hmm. i didn't try it was very difficult to define the feed in many cases. So that's why I just went with the top three ingredients in the commercial feed that they did apply. Yep. Um, and since these are pasture raised now, I don't know. I know the saying among the farmers is, you know, up to like 30% of their nutrition comes from the pasture itself. I'm not, sh I mean, maybe, I don't know. Right. I, I don't, I haven't done any studies, so yeah. I, yeah. I can't say whether that's accurate or not, but if we assume at least some portion comes from it, you know, there's a whole other vari variable to add into oh, that. Yeah, so, sure. Absolutely. I, I Absolutely. mean, it may be the corn, but it also could be, you know, the corn is just a variable that is present, but it's kind of masking other variables that may yeah. do it. So, sure. you know, I think the biggest thing is what we did find with with campylobacter listeria and salmonella using these kind of predictive modelings brood feed on some level usually popped up often hmm. so yeah. to me that just indicates well that's an area where we can really focus some efforts on okay you know and to yeah. do some more analyses and studies to see what the true trends are be and the true effects will be but that's a good place to focus effort it would be yeah kind of a bigger takeaway from that yeah, it makes sense. And, and I think, you know, to that end, again, in a study like this, as you mentioned, it's hard to really say if these are, are, are direct causes versus correlations. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. But also, I think a, a bigger picture is like, you know, our, our a lot of times when we talk about food safety or antimicrobials, we're talking about specific compounds. Uh, and, and we know that there are effective compounds out there, you know, uh, uh, antibiotic alternatives, but the whole picture starts with, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the ecology, the whole system. And so that's going to ultimately influence, yep. you know, the, the tasks that we're handing over to our, our feed additives, you know? And yep. so I think that's, a, that's an interesting take home for me on this. With science led solutions that are sustainable, proven and effective, BASF helps you tackle the challenges of poultry nutrition. We offer high quality feed ingredients that enable a more sustainable production and help you achieve your animal performance targets. We call it the science of sustainable feed that succeeds. Another thing 
you know, not knowing much about uh, microbiology or pastured systems, you know, I would assume that you probably have maybe a higher diversity of, of microbial populations. Is that correct or no? And then are the populations, would you call them more resilient or, you know, how could you compare those to a conventional system or can you speak to that at all? I, I would think that largely, I mean, there could be some diversity differences, but I think largely mm-hmm. the gut of a chicken is the gut of a chicken, whether you raise it in a house or you raise it in a, yeah. in a, outside in a, a coop. Um, I will say I would, I mean, and I don't really have data to back it up, just theoretically, you know, sure. you're going to be exposing the immune system of the chickens, I would say, to a mm-hmm. larger variety of stressors in yep. the out the environmental system versus a house system are a different set of stressors. Yep. Um, so, and probably namely at lower levels, kind of like they're probably testing their immune system a little bit differently than you would in a house. So that could have a, some kind of downstream effect. Um, but I don't see, I mean, a lot of the findings, you know, of course, mine were mostly food safety, but, you know, I didn't see any distinct, oh, you know, obviously it's so much different Yeah. Okay. this way versus commercial. I mean, they were largely yeah. prevalence rates, things like that, relatively similar to what I would expect to see from a chicken, no matter where it was grown. Um, one of the things that this is a larger thing, however you're growing your chicken, I think coming out of this data and, and what I have from other studies we've seen, is when you were talking about uh, feed additives and antimicrobials mm-hmm. or alternative antimicrobials. Mm-hmm. I think the time of app, I think applying it within the first week or two is where you're going to get uh, of, of life is where you're going to get your main benefit. Mm. Continuing to do it after yeah. that fact, I don't think because you want to alter the maturing microbiome to set it up right. to do something. Yeah. Once you get past that two week point, it's it's established, and yeah. so outside of some massive stress event or some massive sickness or that will really shift the microbiome, you're not gonna you're not gonna make many dents in it at that point. So yeah. I would say yeah. a lot of what you know I would recommend is try to really add it early, get the effect early, and then after that, I don't see much value in continuing to add it because once you've established it it's so unless you had something that you need to continue to feed that the natural microbiome wouldn't feed otherwise i don't see yeah continuing to it although i mean my record should also be if the natural microbiome can't support it then it probably isn't going to be all that effective if you have to continue to you know yeah usher it along the entire (laughs) way um from an outside source no, that's an interesting thought. I mean, we, um, you know, as nutritionists thinking about the host a lot, you know, we think uh, a lot about uh, high digestibility feeds, you know, things that aren't going to be anti-nutritive, um, you know, to really as, as the bird and the GI mm-hmm. system is developing. But, you know, probably in years of doing the decades of doing that type of work and that type of thinking, we're, we're probably overlooking that the, the microbiome is maturing right along with that. And, and they're probably certainly not in, independent. And so, you know, we know that that from the host standpoint, that getting that early start can have long term benefits, even at processing. So it makes perfect sense from the, from the microbiome as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Mike. Have a great day. And uh, thanks to all of you for, for Thank you. listening to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. And if you have a poultry nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it and share it with us, feel free to email the research link, uh, the paper where we can find it, or the abstract to hello at wisenetics.com. That's hello at wisenetics.com. And I look forward to hearing from you.